Today we're going to discuss how scientists collect, analyze, interpret, and organize data. There are many ways to collect data during a scientific investigation. Collecting data can be as simple as asking several people the same question. For example, a student could ask his or her classmates what their favorite subject is. Data can also be collected by measuring. Measuring can be done with many different kinds of lab tools, such as rulers and thermometers. Different lab tools measure different things. For example, if a scientist wanted to determine the effect that water has on the growth of a plant, the scientist could measure the plant's growth with a ruler. Data can also be collected by reading books or observing something and writing down how it looks or acts. Writing down information is an important part of collecting data. Making observations is an important part of science. An observation is any information gathered by one of the five senses, seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, or touching. Scientific tools can be used to make precise, accurate measurements during investigations. These tools can include tape measures, scales, thermometers, and beakers. You'll definitely want to organize your observations after the data has been collected. You can organize it into tables and graphs. Tables are used to show and compare numbers in a way that's easier to see. Graphs can make trends, patterns, and relationships in data easier to see. So both tables and graphs are useful when trying to analyze data and make conclusions or inferences. One way to organize a set of numbers or data is to put it into a table. A table may also be called a chart. To learn how to make a table, look at the following example. A student performed an investigation to find out what kinds of insects and how many of each kind were in a sample of pond water. The student's observations are shown below. We had one mayfly nymph in the water sample, four dragonfly nymphs in the water sample, one water strider, two water bloods, and three water boatmen in all of our water sample. Here are some simple steps to follow in order to make a table. Decide what information needs to be put in the chart. Be sure to include what you were studying and the important measurements or observations you made. For example, when making a table with the student's data shown, important information to include would be the types of insects seen and how many of each there were. Then make a title to put above the chart that clearly says what the information in the table is about. In our sample, we put a title of type and number of insects in pond water sample. Simple as that. Then you're going to want to make rows or columns for the data to be placed in. Rows go across and columns go up and down. Each column should have only one kind of information in it. Since there are two different kinds of data to put in the table about pond insects, there should be two columns. Then you put a title at the top of each column to show what kind of data is in that column. The columns for the pond water table should be type of insect and number seen. Make sure any measurements have also got a unit attached to them, such as inches, grams, or seconds. Since only observations and no measurements were made during the investigation on pond insects, no units need to be included in this particular table. Then you fill in the table with the data. Make sure all the information in a row is related. For example, the first row shows one type of insect, the mayfly nymph, and the number of them that were observed in the pond water sample. Graphs are also really important tools. They can be used to organize and communicate the data gathered during a scientific investigation. There are many different kinds of graphs, including bar graphs, line graphs, circle graphs or pie charts, and pictographs. Bar graphs show data as different sized blocks. Taller blocks show larger numbers. When two sets of data do not seem related in a clear way, a bar graph may be a good choice for displaying them together. Bar graphs have an x-axis, which is horizontal, and a y-axis, which is the vertical. Each axis has to be labeled. Each line on the y-axis should stand for exactly the same number of items. It's also important that all the lines on a bar graph are the same distance apart. Like all graphs, bar graphs should have a title. When one thing has been measured in some regular way, the measurement data can be shown with a line graph. In a line graph, there are usually two sets of data. One set is put on the x-axis, the other is put on the y-axis. The two sets of data likely show a clear relationship. For example, 
the numbers in one set of data may get larger when the numbers in the other set get smaller. A circle graph is a good way to show how the sizes of the parts compare to each other and to the whole. Notice that the graph has a title, a key, and labels telling exactly what percent each part of the pie stands for. Pictographs are somewhat like bar charts. Rectangles are used to represent numbers in bar charts, but pictures are used to stand for numbers in pictographs. Since each picture may stand for more than one object, there must be a key telling how many objects each picture represents. In this one, each little person represents one billion people. Here are some guidelines for making graphs. Always put a title on the graph so other people can easily tell what the graph is showing. For bar and line graphs, make sure each, label is, each axis is labeled with the right units. For pictographs and circle graphs, make sure all units are labeled either on the graph or in a key near the graph. Also, make sure the range on each axis of the graph is close to as the same on the range of the data. If the range is too small, the data will not fit on the graph. If it's too large, the graph will be harder to read. The x-axis is the horizontal axis that runs along the bottom of the graph. In a controlled experiment, the variable, which is, if you remember, the thing being changed on purpose, that goes on the x-axis. The y-axis is the vertical, or up and down axis. The thing, between me or the thing being measured goes on the y-axis of the graph. Scientists perform investigations to learn more about something. When an experiment is complete, the scientist studies the data to figure out what it means. The scientist tries to understand how one variable in the investigation affects another. For example, imagine a scientist planted 20 bean seeds in each of seven cups. She then exposed each cup of seeds to a different temperature. The scientist might get data like the following. From this data, the scientist could say that more of the bean seeds sprouted at 75 degrees Fahrenheit than at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. The analysis of data allows scientists to observe patterns or trends. Once a pattern is found, scientists can make predictions. For example, in our seed experiment, the following pattern can be observed. Once the scientist observes this trend, she can predict that fewer than two seeds will sprout at temperatures that are lower than 55 degrees, and fewer than four seeds will sprout at temperatures that are greater than 85 degrees. So she can find the optimum temperature for sprouting of those seeds. After gathering and interpreting the data, a scientist may draw a conclusion. Conclusions are statements that are supported by scientific evidence, such as data and observations collected during an experiment. Conclusions may explain the causes and effects of processes that occur during an investigation. For example, in our seed sprouting experiment, the scientists may conclude that temperature affects seed germination. She may also conclude that 75 degrees Fahrenheit is the best temperature for sprouting that specific bean seed that she used. After the scientist draws a conclusion, she should compare her conclusion with her hypothesis. The comparison may show that the scientist's hypothesis was supported if the conclusion matches the hypothesis, or the comparison could show that the hypothesis was not supported if they do not match. Either way, a valid scientific investigation increases scientific knowledge. Inferences are conclusions or predictions that are made by studying observations. When scientists see patterns or trends in observations, they can make generalizations to summarize the patterns. These generalizations are known as inferences. For example, suppose a scientist discovers a fossilized skeleton of an ancient organism that's never been studied before. The organism is large and has long canine teeth and sharp incisors, much like the modern day lion. The scientist could infer from these observations that the ancient organism was a carnivore or a meat eater. Conclusions are slightly different from observations. Conclusions must be supported by scientific evidence or data. Inferences may be made from data or from simple observations. For example, imagine a student who brings a ham sandwich, an apple, and a carrot, carrot sticks to lunch every day. From this observation, it's possible to infer that the student's favorite foods are ham, apples, and carrots. 
To make a conclusion, however, an experiment must be performed and data must be collected. Hopefully, you now have a better understanding of how scientists collect, analyze, interpret, and organize data.